if we have the apocalypse as our direction, then we kind of know what direction we're going, and we kind of it gives us a clearer idea of what the next step is. And Crowley was very clear that we should have goals that are, in a sense, something that we can never reach. If we have a finite goal, something that we can uh, get to, then by the time we get to it, we have no idea what we're doing. And then it's over. The journey's over, and you need to find another finite goal. And wandering from one finite goal to another is not really a good, uh, a good way to practice the occult. He says, you know, we, this is what, what he talks about when he, the whole Babylon idea, is to lust for something infinite, something that can never really be fully accomplished, because that means that you always keep going. Um, the talk last week that I couldn't make it to, unfortunately, but I, I liked the video, uh, was talking about the path to happiness. And I think that that's uh, very significant. Uh, the philosopher Nietzsche describes happiness in one of his later works as uh, the overcoming of an obstacle. And I think that's probably the best definition for happiness. I think if we have happiness as a goal, that can be a problem. You know, you, 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 want, you, want, you want to be happy, that's your goal? Well, here's a needle, shoot up. Like, that'll make you happy pretty fast. That's your real goal. Um, and happiness in itself is not a condition that's a very productive one. Uh, I tend to think of happiness, because a lot of people kind of go, because uh, one of my favorite lines that I throw out at people when they talk to me about this is I say, happiness isn't one of my goals. I don't try to be happy, I'm not aiming at being happy. I am happy when I have another goal and I achieve something that brings me closer to it. It's a side effect. If you try to make happiness a permanent condition, then you're gonna end up fucking up a lot of other things because there is no way to make happiness a permanent condition. I, I, I heard a great study on uh, CBC where they compared uh, multiple amputees to lottery winners. And they found that in most cases, for pretty much all these people, whether they had something horrible happen and they lost both their legs or they won $100 million, in about a week and a half, they evened out. Whatever it is that you're doing, whatever conditions you're experiencing, it eventually, it very quickly becomes normal. The human beings are adjustable creatures. But whatever our new reality is, even if it radically changes, we tend to uh, we tend to even out pretty quickly. You know, if you're sleeping on a park bench and you find a dollar on the ground, that's a great day. <laughs> like that will make you far more happy than the guy who wakes up uh, in a mansion and gets his, into his BMW or whatever. He's used to doing that. He does it every day. If he finds a dollar on the ground, he doesn't care. It doesn't mean anything to him. And equally, like you know, someone with all these things, maybe his BMW breaks down by the side of the highway. He's really pissed off. He's having a terrible day. Having all that shit doesn't change the fact that he's happy or unhappy. He's, he's going to be unhappy because his, his normal thing is being fucked with. So this is kind of where this imagery and the symbolism comes in. Because Curly is like, as long as we keep our goals to something that we can continually strive for, continually go for, then this kind of joy in going toward these goals, joy in our own strength, joy in overcoming obstacles, becomes something that uh, we can experience on a daily basis and keep working toward these things. And it's, it's, um, it's a great, uh, it, I, and I think that we really do live in a culture which encourages people to try to be happy. Or happiness is, ha what I should say actually, is happiness is, is equated with success. And this is ridiculous on the face of it. Um, and I, I, I love, when people do have ridiculous ideas, ridiculous beliefs, you know, things that are on the face of them completely stupid and completely illogical. And what there's always some idiot in the crowd who says, oh, well, whatever makes them happy, that's fine. And it's like, no, wrong is wrong. Right is right. If you're, if you're incorrect, I should say wrong, I suppose that implies morality, but correct is correct, incorrect is incorrect. And if something is incorrect, it doesn't matter if it's making you happy or not. That's not the point. It's not the point of life. Um, yeah, so on that note, um, this brings us to the card, which uh, is totally reinvented, where there's no sort of even shades of, uh, of the previous decks, which is the Aeon card. Um, originally, in the, in the older tarot, it's shown as the Last Judgment, uh, where the dead rise up uh, at, the, at the end of things, uh, at the final revelation, and uh, you know, the, the dead rise up to be judged. Uh, Crowley got rid of this altogether, partly because a, a large part of this has to do with the role that death plays in Thelema. Every, uh, every, every religion has to grapple with the idea of death, essentially. It's, it's one of the main human questions. Uh, Crowley, in some of his works, actually identifies suffering in itself as the, the root of all forms of religion. Uh, just some, when people suffer, they want to know why. They want to have answers for questions. And that's what gets people asking questions, because when they are happy, no one says, oh, why am I happy? <laughs> Where did this come from? It's not a question that you ask, really, because you're happy. You just kind of enjoy it. When you suffer, on the other hand, you want to know what the fuck is going on. Um, 
and death is sort of that ultimate form, that ultimate fear, final destination, all that shit. Uh, but what Crowley wants to do with the idea of death is say, no, it's a, uh, it's not a, it's not a permanent thing. We should not look, we shouldn't look at death as anything different than a sunset. It's just the end of one life, moving on to the next. It's not a big deal. Uh, it's not certainly not something that we should be afraid of or worried about. The whole concept of a last judgment is a sort of get, puts with the idea that death is some kind of final condition that uh, that we end with. And B, well, Crowley believes that this whole concept was superseded when he got the Book of the Law and sort of goes into the next, uh, and we start the new way on it. So uh, you know, to him, this last judgment thing already happened in a sense, or it's, it's taken place. So this, was, this is antiquated, uh, this whole idea. Um, so he tosses it out and he puts in with the card that he calls the Aeon, which is uh, sort of a reproduction of the stellar of the feeling and in a sense, it changes the divinatory meaning of the card completely. Uh, in Crowley's summary at the end, uh, he just calls it like, the, what this card means is that a step has been taken. It's, it's a sign that you're moving in that direction and you know, you're definitely taking a step and doing something moving forward, uh, which is a big change. Uh, it takes the sort of finality out of that idea and it takes the finality out of the whole cycle, cycle of, the, uh, of the major arcana in general. Because uh, it is the second last card, um, and it's sort of a, a way of expressing that idea that, okay, we are in the current of the new Aeon, and nothing's finished. We're moving on, uh, and the current is going to continue to spread and continue to take over the old Aeon concepts that still exist in our institutions, in our social ideas, and we should be expecting to see them erode and erode and erode, and that will happen over and I, that will be, we'll get back to that idea. Um, so, we've talked a bit about the angels' intentions, uh, but what I see, what my opinion is on the angels' intentions of uh, initially giving D and Kelly the system and having it move on to Crowley's work and spread out. Uh, the timing of this book is very significant. It came out around the end of World War II, and this was a big deal for Crowley uh, because he saw, in, in two world wars, he saw a great deal, I, I talked in the beginning of this about how a great deal of occult material was destroyed. Well, he saw that happen. That was his initial um, motive for publishing uh, 777 and putting secret Golden Dawn papers in the public eye and publishing them so people could buy them. He realized that if this stuff didn't get out there, then it had the potential to be destroyed and lost forever. <coughs> so uh, he, he, this was sort of the, the motivation for his efforts doing that. So I want to talk a little bit about Curly's motivation for putting this out there. Uh, in his letters to Frida Harris, he, uh, well, he, he has a couple of ideas, and there are a few things that he's worried about floating around. Uh, one thing that he was greatly concerned with, which we've totally lost, and it's actually kind of disappointing that the modern OTO didn't keep this restriction. Curly insisted very strongly that um, the cards were not to be sold without a copy of the book. Um, he felt that that would be, encourage them to be used for fortune telling, for, you know, scams, for people doing things with them that he really would, he, which he saw was sort of to profane this information. So he wanted to make sure that anyone who got the got the cards got the book. And his original idea that when it did finally get printed, they did a fairly expensive printing. But uh, they, they were they were both worried about doing that at the time. He was talking about actually doing a printing with no pictures, no color plates, uh, on the cheapest paper possible, uh, the cheapest way that you could put it out possible. Part of this was because you know England uh, was living in the shadow of war. Uh, food was rationed, supplies were rationed. People just did not have the money to spend on editions of books like the ones he uh, he put out with uh, like when he originally published book four. Um, I forget it, it was ridiculously expensive. Like he was using particular inks that had magical significance, particular paper that had magical significance. You essentially had to be pretty rich to buy this book, which is part of the reason that it sold very few copies initially. But um, and he, but that was his intention because Crowley just felt that there was no point in putting this stuff out there for the average working class person because that person was not going to have the time to, stu to study and to practice and to do all these things. There's certain points in his, uh, in his own writings where he just basically says, it's like, if I had to hold down a regular job, there's no way I could have done any of this shit. It's like the fact that he was a man of leisure, that he could fart around and you know, he was essentially living on his trust fund or whatever the equivalent was at his time, uh, gave him the leisure time to do all these things, to have these experiments, to drink and do coke and party and and to uh, make the discoveries that he made. Um, 
of course, I think that uh, we can organize our time a little better because we do live in a culture where pretty much everyone does have to hold down a job. We don't have a lot of just men of leisure kicking around these days. So everyone has to learn how to manage their time a little more effectively. Whatever sacrifice that means that they have to make, they have to make. Um, the other thing that Crowley was majorly worried about at this point was his own reputation. Earlier in his life, he does, he did a lot of very, you know, extravagant things. Uh, he captured a lot of media attention. He was a tabloid darling. Uh, the Abbey of Thelema at Kefalu attracted a lot of attention, particularly after Raoul Loveday died. Um, uh, and his wife sort of blamed Crowley for all this. Uh, Crowley's antics got him a lot of press in the papers. And he's, he writes later on in his life that he kind of, at the time he thought this was great and he just, he liked being, he, he liked the attention I think, but later on he said, that it caused problems for him because when he's trying to get people to take him seriously, when he's talking about politics, and he's talking about science, he's talking about you know all these things, he found that it was very difficult to get people in authority positions to take him seriously just because the reputation that he had made for himself uh, was working against him at that point. So at one point in his letters to Frida Harris, he says, "Look, look, he's like, I don't even want my name on this." He says, "You know, tell people you wrote this book. I, so don't even tell them that I wrote it <laughs> because then it's just going to detract from it." Uh, Although I, it did, uh, I believe it did eventually get published under his name, but this was uh, a big concern for him initially, uh, whether or not he should even be associated with it. And of course, Crowley was famous for writing things himself under different names to give the AA the illusion that it had more people involved with it than it did. Uh, he even actually, and if you look at um, if you look at the the letters to Harris uh, that are online, there's a, a chunk of it at the end, which is an open letter from the Society of Hidden Masters which is sort of a criticism of Crowley, putting out this book of the tarot, saying, you know, oh, you shouldn't do this. Like, you've done this, this, and this. You're clearly trying to do this, this, and this when you're putting out this book. And it's very kind of scolding, uh, which was published um, in, in newspapers and whatnot uh, as an open letter to Alistair Crowley from the Society of Hidden Masters, which, of course, Crowley wrote himself uh, to attack himself publicly to try to, I guess, <laughs> in a way, it's actually really good to read because the way that he chooses to attack himself reveals very clearly what his intentions were with the tarot. It's in a way his explanation of the Book of Thought, which he does in trying to fight himself, I guess. Um, but it, 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 again, like this is him like going back to his own reputation and trying to trying to distance his reputation from his work, just so that people will read it seriously, will take it seriously. That was a big concern of his, um, and. The, and yeah, 